Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Thank you uh, all for being here and welcome. It's certainly a delight to be back at the Commonwealth Club. I say back at the Commonwealth Club even though this is a new Commonwealth Club and I'm going to have to get used to this after all these years of being in the old place. But um, it's great that they have uh, these new digs and as some of you know KQED where I was a talk host of Forum for 24 years also has new digs. Uh, and. Um, these post-pandemic digs, I hope, will serve everyone well. And I hope that today's conversation with Mary Lamia will serve you well as, as I expect uh, and have every sense that it will. Let me just say by way of introduction um, that I'm not only pleased to be here, but pleased to be talking with uh, Dr. Lamia, who I've got a script in front of me that says is an old friend, and I hesitate to use that description. Uh, I, we, we certainly have a, a long history of friendship and uh, someone I admired for many years and had on my program for a number of years. Uh, we go back to the days when I was in commercial radio with ABC. Uh, and Mary has been lionized as one of our finest psychologists operating here in Northern California. I say that because recently in the Pacific Sun she was selected as the best psychotherapist in Marin County. I don't know how they decide things like that, but uh, nevertheless, I think it's earned and deserved. And she's written a number of books, and this latest book uh, is about grief, and it's a difficult subject to discuss because it's often so verboten and so radioactive and charged with all kinds of emotions. But I think you'll find that she has a keen intellect and certainly a perceptive sense of giving and, and I use that word without any hesitation because I think she's one of these psychologists who is giving always not only the benefit of her knowledge but a great deal of compassion and empathy. Um, and um, I don't want to give too much of a, um, a prelude talk here because um, I might embarrass her, but uh, I think you'll find this conversation useful. I hope you will. I hope it will serve the public and serve you individually, uh, those of you who are here and those of you who are with us online. Uh, she's also, I should mention, uh, in addition to the author of a number of books, professor in the doctoral program at the Wright Institute and has been there a number of years. Um, and it's great to have her here with us. Mary, welcome. Thank you, Michael. Also, uh, let me mention relevant, because this is in the script, relevant wealth advisors. We're always thankful and grateful to those who give scripts, uh, excuse me, who, who give support. Um, before we go into the conversation, I just want to give a reminder to echo what was said before. If you're here in the audience and you have a question for Dr. Lumia, just simply write it down on one of the question cards and they'll be brought to me during the program. We will make every effort and endeavor to get to your questions. If you're watching online, simply put your question in the YouTube chat box and those questions will also be brought to me during the program. So uh, you might also not only bring questions to the fore here, but also experiences that you have that you want to well apprise us of and get Dr. Lumia's reaction, but also those who are online with us and those in the audience here. Um, your own experiences with grief, mourning, bereavement. I found through the years of being the host of Forum that this was always difficult to navigate because as I said, it's often a highly charged topic and people find it difficult to talk about. It's intimate, it's personal, and it carries a lot of weight from one's inner life. But we're going to talk about it, and I th think we'll talk about it in ways that will be useful. Let's begin, Mary. Um, I mean, your, your title of your book is certainly very telling. Um, let me give the whole title. Grief isn't something to get over. Finding a home for memories and emotions after losing a loved one. So the idea of grief not being something to get over, people talk about closure, they talk about you know a certain time period of mourning and suddenly things are supposed to be okay or bearable or I'm not supposed to be getting all kinds of reminders of what I call the presence of absence. It's not original, it goes back to James Joyce and Derrida. 
James Joyce originally, Derrida stole it from him. But I want to get your sense of why people are under this illusion that they can get over grief. Because in some instances, in fact, there's a new AMA report that says grief can be prolonged, it can last lifetimes, and often does. It's impossible to get over grief because we have a system of memory. And you know, just a little story about that title. Uh, originally, a publisher had contacted me and wanted me to write a book about shame for the public since I had written one for clinicians. And uh, I said, well, if I'm ever going to write another book, it'll probably be a book about grief. In fact, it would have the title, Grief Isn't Something to Get Over. And she really liked the idea, uh, at least the acquisitions editor did. So I wrote a proposal, and we took it to the development editor. And when we, in the meeting with the development editor, um, she said, well, you can't title a book like this. You know, people have to get over it. You have to tell them how to get over it. And then she told me a story about a relative who, at every family gathering, would talk about her deceased son. And it was kind of annoying to her. And she said, that's why you have to tell these people how they can get over it, how they can get past it. So I found another publisher. <laughs> and then uh, they really liked the title of the book and, and helped me add a subtitle. And we went on. But yes, there is this false belief that of, of closure and acceptance. The, the concept of uh, acceptance bothers me because, you know, we, we accept that a loss has happened. We accept that somebody has died. I mean, we have to be a bit psychotic not to accept that somebody has died. There's a reality there. However, what we can't accept, we can't accept our feelings. What we feel about a loss is something that is foreign to us. It, it's so painful. Anguish and, anguish and grief, um, anguish and high distress are what we feel. That's what grief is made of. It's, grief is a, is, isn't really an emotion. It's a state, emotional state, that's composed of a blend of emotions, it's a blend of uh, anguish or distress and sometimes shame or anger, uh, fear. It depends what blend there is, and then you feel what you, as you do. Uh, negative emotions motivate us to seek relief from them, and that's what people want when they feel, when they are grieving. They want relief from that grief. But really what we have to do is understand what it is exactly we're feeling and why. And Sometimes the intensity of those feelings can make you realize just how important that person was to you and make you cherish that person even more. You know, I remember a poem by Kay Ryan that essentially had that, uh, the, the feeling of loss that I have makes me realize how dear and how valuable that person was in my life. So you don't want to necessarily short circuit those emotions and yet at the same time it's, it's very difficult to navigate because sometimes the grief can be so overwhelming that you have to sort of provide some way of diminishing the emotions lest they overwhelm you. I mean, isn't that kind of a delicate balance that we're talking about? Yes, because we focus on the fact that there's a loss rather than on the positive memories that come up. And that's part of the problem with grief is that our brain cannot reconcile the fact that the person was there for so long, at least in our memory system, it's they're right there, and then they're gone. And what does our memory system do when, when one day somebody's there and the next day they're gone? Well, it just can't integrate that information. And so for a number of weeks after somebody dies, we have all kinds of symptoms. For example, uh, your memory, implicit memories are telling you that something is missing but what happens is that you misplace something. There's that symptom. I misplaced so many things that weren't really misplaced. I just couldn't see them after my husband died. And it was so odd, I had to start, I just started laughing about it, you know, for, for a brief time there because it was just, that's what I wrote about in the book and it was happening to me. It doesn't only happen with grief though. It has, I just saw recently, uh, wonderful uh, stand-up comics, people may know her from Curb Your Enthusiasm, Wanda Sykes, and 
she's talking on the phone and she's saying, you know, you know, I, I misplaced my phone and I don't know, <laughs> at the same time as she's talking <laughs> on the phone, and I can't find it, I don't know where it is. I mean, it, but particularly when you lose a loved one, it can set everything off in terms of the equanimity and the normality of what we think of as the ordinary of our lives. And memory plays such an important part in your book and, and the emotions that are triggered by memories. And in fact, uh, I, I found myself thinking about Proust and the difference between what he described as voluntary memory and involuntary memory. To some extent, involuntary memory comes at you all the time, cascades toward you because of a smell or an image or a song or whatever. Voluntary memory is when you're actually you know, remembering someone and thinking about those memories. But they both can be terribly jarring and upsetting, and at the same time, they can be comforting, right? Well, sensory memories and involuntary sensory memories are absolutely fascinating. Proust talked about it in terms of tasting a, a madeleine and a cup of tea at his mother's and feeling this sense of joy. And then he would take another sip of tea and another bite of the madeleine and another and another, and he realized that slowly the, the joy was diminished a bit. And, and so when we think about, well, there's a couple of things about that. And one is, um, Olfactory memory and, and memory for taste are very, very, very powerful. Anybody who's had COVID and lost their sense of smell and taste knows uh, that you're blocked from a, a great deal of information when that happens. So uh, it's very primitive in some ways when we think about it, but if you, but if you taste something, if you smell something, you might have a flood of, of memories, but if you taste something many, many times, there's this valley that forms where you don't have the same feeling, but the feelings are inside of you. They're not the Madeline, they're not the tea, says Proust. It was inside of him. Problem with uh, tasting something over and over again and getting sort of numb to it is that we do that with people, in a sense. We get used to somebody we've lived with for a long period of time or somebody we've known for a long time. And so after we lose them, we often think, well, I regret that I didn't do this, or I regret that I didn't appreciate them, or I regret that I didn't say I love you one more time. When um, my husband died last year, my older son said, if only I could have had one more conversation with him, if only I could have said goodbye. But as I say in the book, and I told him, goodbyes are just one moment in our lifetime with somebody. They're not all of our moments. Those kind of regrets are very difficult sometimes to integrate and, um, and, and very challenging indeed. But I just want to stay with Proust for a moment, and then I want to ask you about your husband, because ironically, you were sort of with the drafts of this book, and then you lost your husband. But also, there's a lot of your own personal experience that's melded into this book, the loss of your mother at age 11, the loss of your father when you were 21. And, uh, I, wa I want to get into your own responses as a psychologist from the personal standpoint, which you're brave enough to write about in this book. But I remember... Or dumb enough to write about. Well, <laughs> it's often the same thing, isn't it? <laughs> um, but I, I remember being struck by Proust, just to be personal for a moment, my own memory bank with the fact when my mother was dying, um, Proust, when his mother was dying, it wasn't his mother anymore. It wasn't the mother that raised him. You know, the mother of his boyhood was now this woman who was on the brink of death, on a death's precipice. And uh, soon enough, of course, she was gone. But the memories often are of a person who is infirm and sick and not the person of vigor or vitality that we knew as children, as teens, as even adults. And that's a very, I mean, psychologically, that's a very difficult thing to coordinate, uh, to, to kind of bring into a, I'll use a psychological word, to a gestalt that makes sense. Could you talk about that? Well, especially if it's a shocking scene, because when uh, I found my husband in the patio having a stroke, uh, that that flashbulb memory we call it. It's it's a it's a s memory of a highly emotional scene for us, and it just sticks in our 
memory bank and we recall it over and over and over again. Uh, people have those kinds of flashbacks all the time of various scenes. I had to remind myself, and I suggest people do remind themselves if they have those kinds of memories, that that is one moment and to remember all the other positive scenes we've had with that person. Otherwise, that one negative scene sticks in your mind, or your mother infirm sticks in your mind versus the, the mother of your childhood who offered you so much. So it's important to think about you know, what we learn from somebody and the positive memories we have. And yes, they cause us grief because we grieve because we remember when things were different. We grieve because we lost something that felt special to us. And it's the positive memories that make us grieve, not anything negative. So those positive memories, on the one hand, can be comforting. Um, but on the other hand, they can uh, exacerbate the grief, yes? Uh, they, they absolutely cause the grief. Yeah. It's remembering the good things that are no longer there. So what do you suggest, I mean, just on a practical level, about ways to diminish grief when it's so overwhelming as to be, I mean, for some people it can be paralyzing. It can be, you know, uh, bring their life to a standstill and, be, and bring depression on and so forth. Well, and that's what, why they created the diagnosis of prolonged grief in the DSM-5 and in the international classification of diseases. When, when people suffer so much, they're not living their life at all. I mean, one of the reasons to create a diagnosis is so, so that people get coverage for insurance and they get the kind of care they need and the kind of understanding they need. But what's interesting to me is that there's so many people walking around experiencing grief and having their grief activated by seeing a restaurant or something that reminds them of that person every single day. But grief tends to be silent. That's one of the reasons why I wanted people to talk about their experiences of loss if, if they want to share those, because we keep grief to ourselves for the most part. Uh, the mental health profession, for such a long time, believe that children don't grieve. But if you talk to a young child about a loss, of course they do. And they keep that person with them in their mind forever. I kept my parents with me in my mind, and they fortunately motivated me, what I remembered of them, to achieve what I did. I mean, my mother used to say uh, she could fix anything except a broken heart. Well, why did I become a psychologist? You know, I mean, it just was right there. I wanted to do what she couldn't do. You wanted to please your mother and get pride from your mother, even though she was not dead, not there, right, absent. But Go she on. was. Um, the people we love and lost are inside of us, and we can learn from them. And that's one of the ways to mute grief a little bit, to think about, what can I learn? How does this inspire me? How does this make me more of who I am? You know, I have a scene in my head of my father, who only had an eighth grade education, studying math books all the time. He was always at this little desk in this, with this little light, studying a math book, wanting to learn more. And, and so the motivation for me to learn and achieve was very, very strong. I mean, who would get a PhD in my Sicilian family? Nobody got a PhD in my family. And, but I was driven in some ways with the idea in mind that he would be proud of me. That's something that I think you emphasize is the positive uses of grief, the way that grief can motivate you and move you forward and actually lead you to accomplish things, as you just mentioned. Um, it's hard sometimes for people to get that kind of mindset, though, to get themselves out of just, I mean, because grief can overcome, as we've been saying, and make you sluggish and make you laconic and make you just ineffectual sometimes. It depends. In fact, grief, it seems to me, I just wonder what your response is. It's always seemed to me that, you know, it's, a, it's very individual how we respond to grief. Grief is so personal, absolutely personal. 
I don't think any two people grieve in the same way. And personally, even in the sense that it can be different at one phase of your life than it is at another phase, in terms of your grieving for a loved one or your remembering whatever those memories may be. Memories change. In fact, I remember Jerzy Kosinski, a name I didn't think I would bring up in our conversation today, but he talked about how feelings are accommodated, memories are accommodated, by, uh, they accommodate feelings, or feelings accommodate memories, which is sort of what you say in some ways, isn't it? Uh, in a sense, but, but memories do change. They alter as we take on more information and integrate it. Uh, we kind of reconstruct our memories a little bit. Remember, we have a, our brain has this way of pattern matching. So if we come across information in our present life, it sort of searches for a pattern in all of our memories that, that matches. And it integrates that little bit of information in there. So, I mean, you can imagine that memories do change as it integrates information. Well, you get a loss, and that doesn't fit with anything. So what do you do with that? It takes your memory time. You, you have to have day after day of memories of that person not being there. What about when the memories conflict? I mean, you know, you can have a loved one that you've lost, source of comfort and joy and you know, instruction for your life and everything. And that same person can be, you know, filled with all kinds of negative memories and, and emotions that, you know, you don't necessarily want to feel and don't provide any sense of solace in your grief. Well, it's sort of fascinating because uh, think about in terms of evolution, what does memory do? Memory protects us. Memory informs us. It, it gathers and organizes and stores and then brings up information to us to tell us what to do in the present and to anticipate our future. That's what memory is. And, and so uh, if somebody dies and we don't have all positive feelings toward them, Often what happens is a strange thing. We remember the positive things about a dead person rather than the negative. Now, why is that? Well, we don't have to remember the negative anymore. If, if somebody we don't like dies, we don't have to prepare ourselves for the future of, of, of seeing them. So we don't have to defend ourselves so much. But you, I was just thinking of, this is a kind of um what what Proust would call a memory that came from involuntary memory. I remember once having a discussion many years with you about The Sopranos, which we both liked and enjoyed very much. And Livia, Tony's mother, kept talking about the father is a saint. I mean, mm -hmm. she was going through this kind of personal hagiography, like people do often when they lose a loved one. You know? mm -hmm. um, I wonder, as a psychologist, if you think it's, it's because people do that. Um, Widows do that, widowers do that. Um, or is it better to see the feet of clay and re realize you know, the limitations? That but why? You don't, you don't need that information for the future, so you might as well make it faint. <laughs> That's very practical response. <laughs> so it's OK to? I'm Sicilian, Michael. You have to make them a saint. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could make your loved one into something maybe even more than they were. That's OK. It feels better also to remember the positive things. But it's mostly because that's the way our memory functions. It prepares us for the future. But memory also grabs hold of us sometimes and takes hold of our thoughts in ways that we don't necessarily welcome or expect, right? Uh, how so? Well, again, I'm thinking about that notion of involuntary memories. I'm thinking about when I've lost loved ones, all of a sudden there'd be a whole collage of memories, and some of them are conflicting with others. Some of them are good, some of them aren't so good. Well, the one way memory really grabs hold of us is through our implicit memories. That's how, how it controls us in some way. Implicit memories, there's, let's say there's implicit memories, which are sort of unconscious, and explicit memories, which we're very aware of. So Im implicit memories are, a simple example is learning how to ride a bike or tie your shoes. You don't 
you don't have to relearn how to tie your shoes every single time. It's, it's buried in our implicit memory. Uh, implicit memories are responsible for the people we're attracted to. Uh, they're responsible for moods. They're responsible for things like when you think, why am I, why am I thinking about that right now? Why am I thinking about that person right now? And if you just followed it for a while, you would find that it, your implicit memory is trying to tell you something. Memory is wonderful. It tries to inform us. So talk a bit about how you use something like implicit memory to feel consoled or to feel not necessarily even comforted, but at least to alleviate some of the pain that comes from grief. Um, well, we don't really know what's in our implicit memory, but we could make it explicit. For example, uh, an example I give in the book is of a woman who had a very, very difficult time in the afternoons after her husband died. She would just sob. It was just, it was just awful for her. She was in anguish every single afternoon. So she would make sure that she got out of the house because if she was in the house, she was sure to, to cry. And that was an implicit memory at work. She realized why she would cry in the afternoons and why afternoons were so horrible for her. It was because every afternoon at, let's say, 4 o'clock, she would hear the garage door open every day, and her husband would come home. He'd walk into the house and greet her warmly. It's almost Pavlovian in a way, isn't it? Right, and so she realized that she was waiting for her husband to come home, yeah. and he wasn't coming home. And so those early weeks were torture for her. Well, as it turns out, you know, she did something with that. She made that implicit memory explicit just by realizing what was going on in the afternoon. But also, she kind of made up that it's 4 o'clock, he's going to come in the house, and at 4 o'clock she would say, Hi, honey, and laugh. And that lessened the anguish? Absolutely. Diminished it, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's a matter of understanding and appreciating our memories that create the feelings related to grief. Which leads me to another question along similar lines. Um, since we're talking about implicit memories and things that trigger memories. Uh, I did interviews through the years with people like Joyce Carol Oates and Joan Didion, who both wrote about being widows and wrote very profound books about what it meant. And in both cases, there would, like Didion didn't want to get rid of her husband's shoes, you know. Um, and, and, and there's that sense of tenacity of clinging to what to do about that. What, what, I mean, what do you suggest to your patients? Is, or what do you say in your book about those kinds of attachments that are so tenacious. We're all so different in terms of uh, hanging on to things. I wrote a Psychology Today blog about it just recently. Why we hang on to things and should we hang on to things? That's such a personal decision. For some people, having a loved one's things around just reactivate their memories over and over again and they can't tolerate it. But rather than get rid of them, Sometimes it's best to put them away somewhere for a while until some time passes and then to make a decision. There are some people who want to uh, move immediately. They don't really want to move. They just want to get away from their anguish. Mm. It's, it's our feelings that we want to flee from. And, and those go with us. So time does heal. I mean, is that a cliche or is it true? Well, it depends how you think about that. The only reason time heals is that the memory system reconciles a loss a little better as time goes on. But we don't get over the loss. It's still there. It's always there. Mm -hmm. And we just deal with it differently because our, our memory has taken on all kinds of new information that sort of mutes the old one a little bit but it doesn't make it go away. Yeah, this idea, again, and it's in your title, that, that grief can suddenly, you think about the horror of somebody losing a child, for example, and you know having there's to There's nothing worse. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and yet somehow there's this notion that, well, 
time is a great healer, so time will make it, will bring closure or will bring some kind of ability to move on. Well, that's why I was so motivated to finally write, write this book, is that story the, that editor told of being so annoyed at the person who lost a child, yeah. who just wanted some acknowledgement that he was there with her. And uh, losing a child is impossible to get over. Uh, after my husband died, a few months after my husband died, uh, my older son was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And that used to be a death sentence. And, and just anticipating the loss of my child was a sense of more than I could handle. And just going through his, his treatment um, has been tough, but he's going to be OK. Um, but that was a hard road. And I can't even imagine. Well, I can't imagine, because I've seen so many people who have lost children. There's nothing worse. One of the things that seems to help people, you know, I wrote a book called Spiritual Envy many years ago, and it was about God and about uh, spirituality and all that, but it was also um, my awareness of someone like Rose Kennedy, who you know, lost sons and yet was able to say, I have my faith and I have my God and Jesus to comfort me and so forth. There's a lot to be said for that. I well, but even people like Rose Kennedy I'm sure have not exposed what they feel on a daily basis. Most people don't. I, I wrote in the book talking to a friend who, who lost uh, her fiance 20 years before. And I had never talked to her about it, you know, after the, after the loss. And I said, well, what do you do with that loss? I mean, do you ever think about him? And she said, I think about him every single day. It doesn't go away, but we don't expose it. Grief is so personal. Grief is silently held. Is it good to be busy and occupied then when you're in a grieving state to just keep your mind occupied and give you? I mean, people think work can be a great ally sometimes with grief. Is that true for you? Uh, well, being a workaholic, I would say yes, <laughs> probably so, because it helps me compartmentalize. But, you know, I, as I was finishing the publisher's edits for the book, is the week I was finishing them, my husband died. And they let me hold on to the manuscript for a while to add him to the book, which I did. And did that help? Uh, I was busy focusing in some ways on him, but I was focusing on the book and cried and wrote and cried and wrote, and, and I guess that helped, but it doesn't go away. It's the memories are still there. And you write about, I, I said I wanted to ask you about your own personal losses, especially going back when you were a child and losing your mother, which you write about, and, um, and, and also write about the whole phenomenon of anniversaries of deaths and how they come back to us. And, and make uh, uh, a sense of the, how palatable the loss is just by recognizing that this is one year, five years, 10 years, whatever. So. Or not recognizing it because uh, anniversaries, birthdays, everything is stored in our implicit memory. We may not remember somebody's birthday or the anniversary of the loss, but our implicit memory does. and and and. It's striking how, at times, uh, people get into a mood or, uh, oh, people with seasonal affective disorder, for example. They say they have seasonal affective disorder. I always try to find out and listen for, did something important happen during the winter months? Is this an anniversary reaction that they're not aware of? You know, in terms of my mother, I was convinced as almost everyone I've ever talked to is convinced that I was going to die at the same age in which she died. Mm -hmm. I was completely convinced of that. But because I knew about anniversary reactions as a psychologist and was early in my, in my career uh, before I was licensed, when I was an intern, worked with a man who had a profound anniversary reaction to the death of his father and a, and a depression that was 
severe and he didn't know where it came from, like it was out of nowhere. But it turned out he was turning the age his father was when his father died, when he was, the, the, my patient was seven years old. And uh, I thought, well, it's not going to happen to me because I know. I know the date, I know what happens. Well, it did. In fact, my mind played a real trick on me. Memory also has a way to protect us, oddly enough. So it uh, made me think that the, date my, the day my mother's age was a year older than she was when she died. So that as I was anticipating turning 44, it was really 43 I had to worry about, and, and so, and I even looked it up, and I saw that she was, in my mind, she was 44 when she died, but she wasn't, she was 43. It's quite a Freudian slip. I mean, it was <laughs> quite a, a trick of my, of my mind. And I, I thought back when I realized it when I was 44 and I didn't die, I looked back and sure enough, it, it had passed, and I thought, what was I doing the year she died? What was I doing when my age matched hers exactly? Well, it was funny, you know. I had started running on a, on a mountain. I turned in my suburban uh, housewife station wagon for a hot little sporty car with a sunroof. And uh, I did all kinds of things that were significant for being alive. So as a practicing therapist for all these years, how much can therapy and the whole cathartic process help people with grief? I mean, you mentioned you know, some successes with patients. I imagine there have been successes. There have been also challenges with, which weren't as, success, as successful. I mean, you know, uh, any therapist has stories that are successful, uh, stories as well as those that didn't turn out to be successful. Is there any way to speak generally about how much psychotherapy can really help or the therapeutic process, catharsis with grief? Well, you know, Shakespeare was the one who said, give sorrow words. And Freud believed that talking about one's losses could help. Does catharsis help? Not really. The relationship helps. Having somebody there as a pillar of support, having somebody uh, to, to aid your stability is very helpful. It doesn't have to be a therapist, though, does it? It doesn't have to be a therapist. That's why grief group helps people form relationships. And, and talking to people who understand. Talking to somebody who doesn't say, well, you just got to get over it. And you got to move past this. And people do say that. They do uh, say that. Yeah. It's also it's something almost to grieve over about how insensitive and, and obtuse people are about the grieving process. Uh, and again, I come back to the fact that for many people, it's just too charged and too forbidden a topic. They don't even want to talk about it. I mean, well, there's been some research about uh, uh, social gatherings and how people who have lost a loved one. Uh, it's okay to talk about that loved one as long as you're laughing and smiling. But if you cry, it's not okay. People don't want to be around those people as much. Uh, my uncle Horace, my uncle Horatio in the book, uh, was amazing at that. He was such a good role model because he could talk about somebody who had died, my mother, his mother, whoever it was, in a conversation, we'd be having a conversation about something, he'd say, well, your mother would say, and he would start to cry, and then he would pick right back up and keep going. Mm. And it was a, a, a beautiful way to express grief at the same time, stay connected to the person he was talking to. Let me talk about that for a moment with you, because I think sometimes there are people who don't quite know what to say to one who is grieving, they try to offer words, but they think these words are cliches or they're platitudes and they don't really strike at any of the heart of anything. And then you have people who won't even mention the name of a loved one who's lost because they don't want to remind the person of that loss. Mm -hmm. So some wisdom to shed on those kind of things? Uh, rather than ask the grieving person how they feel, 
or what they're thinking about. Sometimes it's useful to talk about your own experience, to, to bring that person up yourself. So to talk about your own memories or something you thought about, about the person who was lost. And that invites the grieving person to share their experiences as well. Mm. But most people in the throes of grief are, are holding on tight, you know, to keep themselves intact. So they don't want to talk about it. They keep it personal, as though they're holding on to that person too inside of them. But if, but if you sense that a grieving person can talk about it, absolutely ask. Well, is there anything to say aside from, you know, my condolences and my sympathies and maybe, you know, you lost your father. I remember when I lost my father, those kinds of things that people say that they stumble around with. To have a conversation and see what comes up. Sure, to open up the conversation. I wonder if any of the audience on those cards gave us some experiences that we could respond to. Uh, Certainly. You have them right there. There's an invitation, yeah. <laughs> um, let me see what's on the minds of those in our audience. And uh, First question I looked at, how do you deal with anger? Boy, we might talk about Kubler-Ross and all. <laughs> I mean, she has all these lessons about how to do, go through stages of grief and everything. One of them is anger, isn't it? Um, That's real with grief often. Um, how could you have done this to me, God? Or, why did you die? There's, there are many people who believe they're supposed to be angry because Kubler-Ross said you're supposed to be angry. And that is not true. You, you can feel that down. You could be angry that something happened. But uh, I've, I've had people contrive anger uh, just because they think they're supposed to be angry, because they have to go through these stages that Kubler-Ross says they should go through of denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. That's not how it goes. But people do get angry Kubler when Kubler-Ross has been died, refuted for 20 years, and people still believe those stages, or they go through stages. But sure, people can get angry, and they can feel anger. And anger is a part of grief. Remember, we have anguish and distress, and that could be coupled with anger or shame or fear. Certainly. Any notion of the best way or most effective way to deal with anger when it's real and when it's... Well, anger is a protest. Anger is our wish to make things different and to recognize that we're protesting what the reality is before us. And are we going to make it different by being angry? No, but we're sure going to try. We have to, you know, emotions, emotions are there to help us learn. We learn so much from our emotions if we would only listen to what they're telling us. I'm thinking of Dylan Thomas, though. <laughs> rage, rage against the dying of the light. I mean, you know, that was a wonderful Villanelle poem that he wrote uh, when his father was on his death, the father was on the deathbed. But it was also him raging about the fact that his father was dying and not being able to do anything about it. I mean, there is that sense. But what is that emotion telling us? It's telling us we're helpless. And we don't like to be helpless. There's a lot of shame in helplessness. And so how do we respond to shame? We either attack somebody or we attack ourselves or we withdraw or we avoid. And there is a lot of shame around grief because shame is actually, I mean, we think of shame as a toxic emotion and, and as one where our whole self is bad, feels bad. But shame also signals disconnection, when we are disconnected from somebody. And there's a wish also in shame to reconnect. Well, that is blocked in loss. And that can bring up anger. This is a question from someone in the audience who wants to know, are other cultures better at living with grief? Absolutely. Is part of our problem related to America's fear of aging and death. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so many cultures are so much more open about grief and loss than Western culture. And someone online wants to know, what would you recommend for people who have lost babies whom they have never met? Right. Um, 
that's that's fascinating because just because we haven't met the baby doesn't mean they aren't in our memory. If we think about what or who a baby is going to be, what we're going to name that baby, if it's a boy or if it's a girl or whatever it's going to be, or, or what it's going to do, or where you're going to put it in school, that registers in our memory as a memory. So we have an anticipated future that we've stored away, and then we lose the baby before birth or at birth. That baby is a person in our head with, with all the thoughts we've had about it. And people have plenty of thoughts when they're having a child. So a lost future is a very painful one mm. in grief. I'm thinking of some of these women celebrities, Chrissy Teigen comes to mind, for example, who have lost babies and who have felt intense grief. I mean, and been very public about that mm -hmm. grief. It's, for some, quite profound, just losing the future, as you say. Um, can you have grief for a relationship that was negative? Well, you can have grief for all kinds of things, you know. Um, I mean, when we talk about loss, it's a wide spectrum, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's a different kind of grief when a relationship is negative, though. I mean, it's not necessarily a relief when somebody dies, always. You know, because the memories are still with you. In some ways, you could never work anything out. Question online. Uh, does cognitive behavioral therapy, is that an effective way to cope with grief long term? Well, I, I think there is a, a strong wish for people to erase grief, to erase the loss and how it makes us feel. Does cognitive behavioral therapy bury our feelings? Nothing buries our feelings except for time. And the reason time helps is because we have so many more memories that seem to mute a little bit the memories we have in the past of the loss. So uh, some people say, well, what we should do is make meaning out of our loss. So if a loved one dies from cancer, maybe you should um, start an organization that helps people with cancer. Well, meaning making only goes so far. And, in that sense. What we have to do is make new meaning in our lives. Mm. Therapists don't have any kind of magic to make grief go away. We have to make it go away. And how, how can we make meaning out of life, or find meaning in life, that dampens it a bit? I'm struck by the phrasing you used about bear, burying feelings. Um, what, as, as a psychotherapist, what do you think are the consequences that can result from people who feel they need to, or indeed do, bury their feelings? There's something to be said about not uh, emphasizing your feelings or not going over your feelings. You know, some of the more recent research on, on trauma points to it not being a good thing to go over traumas over and over and over again that it doesn't help people to recollect a trauma. It just makes it more, more visible in your mind. But isn't the notion that if you bury your feelings, it'll come out in other consequences and behavioral, or it will have consequences specifically? Uh, and, and who made that up? <laughs> well, yeah, it goes back to Freud, <laughs> pretty much. Absolutely. Yeah. The, one of Freud's early models of the mind is that if you suppress uh, memories, they'll pop out elsewhere. Not necessarily true. You know, we have such a, um, a quest for happiness in Western society, in Western civilization, and the positive psychology movement has gone awry with making us think that we should always feel happy feelings. Every single feeling, every single emotion we have, we learn from. If only we could figure out what they're telling us. This is an online comment. Grief cannot be ignored to appease those who insist on positivity. Hey, there you go. Yeah. Wisdom. Online. When is crying too much during the grieving process? 
Can you really s say when crying gets out of hand or when it becomes excessive? Uh, if, if your life is so interrupted or disrupted for over six months because you're crying constantly and you can't work and you can't think and you can't sleep, then it's too much. Is there something, though, that has like an inner governor, like you think of the governors on trucks, get past a certain speed limit, is there something that tells you your, your grief is excessive, it's going over the line here? I'm thinking particularly about people who often say, I can't get out of bed anymore, you know, or I miss him or I miss her so much, I miss them now, we're in that gender world of uh, that pronoun, that I can't, I can't function. Something that can get if, you started. If you can't function, then it becomes prolonged grief. But that we're talking about after six months to a year. It's six months for children in the DSM and a year for adults. And in, in the ICD, it was short, six months and after. But if you cannot function, then you may need some help in the short term. Even an antidepressant, if that helps, even though antidepressants are being shown not to help so much these days, uh, it, it's so individual. It's individual, and yet you just said six months or a year, I mean. Well, they had to give a time frame. Those time frames don't apply to some people. They simply don't, right? They don't. No. So is there any inner mechanism or any kind of notion in one's uh, own inner life where they say, I've, I've, I've got to pick myself up, I've got to, this has gone on too long, or it, it's too excessive. Right, if, if one cannot reinvest in life and find some meaning in life, even if that meaning is someday I'm gonna die, I'm gonna be with that person. Mm. That was my father's mantra. He just wanted to die and, and be with my mother, that's all he wanted, and he did. He had uh, heart disease and didn't have the surgery. Mm. And so, Going to heaven could be, you know, finding some meaning. So you live until you go to heaven. Can you die of grief? Can you die of a broken heart and grief? Well, there is a broken heart. You're saying your father did, I think, aren't you? Well, but he had a, he didn't have actual broken heart syndrome. That's an actual syndrome yeah. caused from extreme stress. And yes, people do die from a broken heart. Someone who says, grief often results in a loss of identity for the loved ones left behind. How do you find your sense of self or who you are after the grief, especially in the case where there are compound losses? Oh, what a beautiful question. Um, we talk about loss, but who is lost? We are lost. Mm. The person who dies isn't lost. Our sense of self is lost. When we're strongly connected to a soulmate or a child, where, where the loss is really profound for the individual, one sense of self and identity is lost along with them because you see yourself as a couple, you see yourself as a team. And that's very, very difficult for some people to extract themselves from that connection with the person they lost. They have to find a whole new identity. They have to find a whole new sense of themselves. It's difficult to do, but it's doable. So for those who are strongly identified with another loved one, you know, you think about marriages, obviously, but also siblings and, you know, um, parents and children and so forth. Um, they're often like, the metaphor that comes to my mind is sometimes you just, it's like you've lost anchorage, you've lost your bearings. And it is like losing an anchor. Yeah. Uh, because another person is is an anchor, uh, it, and especially you see it in soulmate relationships in particular, where people have a very strong emotional resonance, and there's a loss. I mean, all losses are huge, but when our our identities are completely entwined with another, mm -hmm. it's very very difficult. Any suggestions or ways of gaining one's own autonomy and agency back, especially when you feel so adrift? Yes, it's, it's knowing what is taking place, understanding how grief works and how 
loss interfaces with our memories and our emotions is, is very, very helpful. Knowing what is happening to you, if you know that, that you feel so terrible because you've been so intertwined with this person, then it helps. You can have that knowledge, but you can still be eaten up by grief, right? Oh, absolutely. But it helps to know that you're not crazy. Mm -hmm. So what do you do if grief just keeps eating away? Uh, you invest yourself in, in life. You find meaning in life. Not meaning in the loss, but meaning in the life you have left to live. By committing yourself to what life has to offer you or what life yields to you. And it may seem as though life has nothing to offer with the person gone if your identity is, is so connected to theirs and your sense of yourself. Question online, do we learn to grieve better as we lo lose more people? Do we get better at it? Mm. <laughs> so like tennis? <laughs> mm -hmm. The more you play? Yeah. Because all of our, uh, our relationships are different. You know, losing my father was different than losing my mother and losing various uncles and aunts who were close to me and, or, or losing my husband. I mean, it, people are different. Our relationships are different. But you can get inured. I mean, you get to a certain stage of life and suddenly you're losing all your friends if you outlive them. I mean, you're in that older silo and uh, suddenly it seems as if um, you just get used to uh, people that you cared about being in the obituaries almost daily. I'm sorry, I'm speaking a little personally here. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me. But uh, uh, I don't mean to suggest that it becomes anesthetized or anything like that, but... But you do get anesthetized a little bit. I mean, you, you develop somewhat of a shield. Remember, remember there's, there's pattern matching that takes place in our brains. So if, we're, if we have a lot of losses at a certain point in our, our life, you know, our brain is saying, okay, I get that, rather than this is, this is so, such a disconnect. Online question, uh, does grieving for someone you lost but isn't dead yet different? Um, yes. Physiologically, I think he's asking. Physiologically. Psychologically, maybe. S uh, well, it's spelled. Physiologically, I can't do, but yeah, psychologically, Well, let's I talk do. about psychological. That's your, <laughs> that's after all your expertise. Um, we call that disenfranchised grief or loss because it's, it's a loss of sorts, but the person isn't dead. And for, for example, uh, people whose parent has Alzheimer's or dementia, we've lost them. Yeah. But they're still alive. That's hard. Why does grief come up during happy times, especially when you lost a parent young and cry at your kid's happy moments? You know, losing a parent young and having children and raising, raising a child is, uh, you almost get to do your childhood over again in a way because you recognize while your child is having a happy moment with you, you didn't have that with your parent. It's, it's your memory, it's retrospective, it's looking back and it's grieving over something positive, but it's something you lost. Well, it's, it, what comes to mind is uh, I'm in that wonderful world now of being a grandparent. Um, it is wonderful in so many ways. But I'll be with my grandchild and I'll see her delight and happiness and joy and so forth. And then I'll think, it's so sad that my parents aren't here. That's a very human emotion. Yeah. You know. You want to feel the joy within the moment, but instead you're feeling sad, like I am right now thinking about it. I mean, we only have grief from our positive memories. Yeah. It's the, it's the loss and positive memories that conflict that causes grief. Not, as Beckett says, nothing to be done. <laughs> <laughs> 
Except what, what can one do or what should one do? Is there any, uh, can you give us any guidance here? Yes, to take a look at, at the positive memory and say how happy my parents would be if they could see this. Or what did I learn from my parents that makes me a good grandparent? Or what did I learn from my grandparents? Or what positive memories do I have? But it's, it's that contrast. We're sad because we should be sad. We're so afraid of feeling sad that we think we should get rid of grief. Sad is okay. So don't exorcise the sadness. No, it's part of being human. Yeah. Yeah. Like Uncle Orazio, you cry and then you go on. Um, how does grief that brings me sort of to we're, we're, we're almost at the end here uh, it's gone very quickly which is a sign, a good sign I think that we've plumbed some important areas but I'm wondering how grief changes as you get older because um, I notice emotionally I respond differently now I respond I remember teaching Long Day's Journey and Tonight and, and sobbing <laughs> And I never would have done that, you know, as a young man, uh, showing that kind of emotion. And I said to my students, because uh, I'm also a literature professor, uh, I said to my students, this is something that talks about what great art is, that it can reach you on that level. And I think as I get older, I not only get more sentimental, but I get more emotional and more, feel emotions more, or I'm not as afraid of them, I'm not as shamed by them to use. Yes, it's the shame that makes us hold yeah. back. Which is a good thing, but it, it, it makes you experience grief in a different way, doesn't it? Maybe it makes grief more overt. It helps us express it. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to defend against it. It's okay to cry. It's okay to feel sad, even in Western culture. Yeah, because you know pretty soon the worms are going to be at you. Sorry. couldn't. Oh. Uh, that's my morbid sense of humor. <laughs> that's morbid, Michael. <laughs> yeah, I have my morbid moments about this. Um, I mean, I think about the fact that uh, some of us are living into our septuagenarian years now, and you know, um, it wasn't long ago, just decades ago, where people were not expected to live that long. That's right. So it means you live longer with your grieving than you ever imagined you would live with, because our lifespans are much longer. Anyway, um, let me, by way of sort of wrapping things up here, and it's been you know, a very illuminating and important hour with you, um, I wanted you to say something about your work in general, because you've done other books. You did a book about white knights, <laughs> uh, that is, men who uh, see themselves as rescuing women. And, and women who rescue men. And women who, I mean, excuse me, women who see themselves as rescuing men. Uh, change the gender, but... Um, no, both ways. You also wrote a book about procrastination, and it was kind of a heretical book by most standards because uh, mo you know, most people looked at procrastination as being not necessarily a good thing, and you saw some virtues in it. Well, it was a book about motivational styles and what motivates us to get things done, and I interviewed highly successful people who were both procrastinators and non-procrastinators, and I had no vested interest in proving that procrastination is a valid motivational style because I'm not a procrastinator at all but it is a it's valid motivational style you know there's procrastinators and there's task driven people like me and then there's people who fail to get things done and the people who fail are often using the excuse that they procrastinate but highly successful people who procrastinate they you get say it I done. hate procrastinators I should hate myself tomorrow I will <laughs> um, but do you, I'm just curious, is, do you see any pattern here to what you've done as an, as an author in terms of not only where you've been, but where you've gone along a trajectory and maybe where you're going next? Right. Psychology has a lot of myths, a lot of myths, and, and people believe them and, and live their lives accordingly. And so I, I try to think about, you know, what, what's counterintuitive here? You know, what are we not looking at? Often it is not what is obvious. It's not what's talked about. It's not what's exposed. It's what we don't talk about, or it's what's hidden. It's what we don't understand. And so I like to bring psychology to the public and 
help them understand better that it's a complicated endeavor. Another counterintuitive book uh, in the offing here or oh. that's embryonic or that's... Well, maybe the one on shame. That's counterintuitive. That's got its counterintuitive places, but I don't know. Maybe I'll just write blogs, blog posts. Well, it's been a pleasure spending this time with you, and uh, thank you for being so open about your own experiences with grief, and thank you for the work that you've done, and uh, thank you for offering some wisdom on a subject that's very difficult to thank talk about. Thank you as well. And thanks to all of you for being here, and all of you online who joined us. Gratitude is always important. Thank you. Thank you.